view in the cathedral yesterday oh. morning. So we'll make, um, oh, we've got another person coming. I shall keep an eye on the waiting room, but I sure. think we'll make a fairly prompt. Fine, I spot. won't, I won't touch that then if people. Oh yeah, no, that's fine. I can, I can do that bit, that's lovely. So welcome everybody. And we're absolutely delighted to welcome to Art Wednesdays, Dr. Richard Foster to talk to us uh, about one certainly very intriguingly named painting and a, another companion piece. Uh, Richard's no stranger to us at the cathedral or in the diocese, but it's lovely to welcome you back virtually. He's been a don at Winchester College for eight years, teaching history and art history and looking after the school's historic library and art collections. And before joining Winchester, Richard studied at the Courtauld Institute and at Oxford, where he wrote his doctoral thesis on the Church of England in the 1640s and 50s. So, Richard, over to you, and thank you so much for joining us. Okay, thanks, thanks very much. Uh, I'll just do the share, and then you can see my see my pictures. Uh, oh, oh, there we are. Hang on, bear with me. This is where we all have to pray. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we were to call it. Uh, let's just go one, two, three, nine, ten. Oh, there's the dean and his wife. And probably if everybody can mute who isn't Richard until we get to the question bit, that would be brilliant. Okay, if you just stay on, Catherine, just, just to check, no, can, you see that, can you see that all right? That's fine for me. And, yep. you, can hear, and you can hear me all right. I can hear. Yes, I Love. think that's worked fine. Right. Lovely. Then I'll, I'll start. Right, I'm going to talk this evening uh, about two paintings by the Spanish artist Francisco Goya, who worked at, in the end, end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century. Um, there are uh, two paintings. Um, oh, <laughs> my, my PowerPoint. Oh, there we are. It's a bit slow. Um, there are two paintings that, that really in a sense, mark the beginning and end of Lent. Uh, so the first picture I'll, I'll talk about is Goya's strangely named The Burial of the Sardine, which shows a popular religious ritual uh, in Spain performed on Ash Wednesday. And the second picture that I'll talk about is Goya's The Taking of Christ, which is set soon after the Last Supper on Monday, Thursday. Um, we'll start with this one. The strange title of this painting is a reference to the culminating event of a three-day carnival held each year in... Um, sorry, there's a bit of background noise coming from somewhere. I don't know if that's me. Is everyone muted? Okay, I'll carry on. I think that um, is now sorted. Sorry, Richard. That's fine. Great. The strange title of this painting is a reference to the, the culminating event of a three-day carnival held each year in Madrid and elsewhere in Spain that finishes on Ash Wednesday. It's a ritual that continues in many Spanish towns today, uh, and it begins with a procession through the streets and ends with a mock funeral in which a sardine is buried sometimes an actual fish, um, but quite often nowadays a paper mache effigy. The origin and exact meaning of this ceremony is uncertain, but it's usually understood as a symbolic rejection of the excess of the carnival that precedes it and the beginning of the privations of Lent. At first glance, Goya's painting appears light-hearted and celebratory. In the center, men and women wearing carnival masks are dancing, watched in the foreground by an affectionate young couple and a mother holding an eager toddler. But on closer inspection, the painting soon, st soon starts to become unsettling, even disturbing. Some of the carnival masks are truly grotesque. Nearly all of the faces have strangely vacant even manic expressions. It isn't quite clear which figures are wearing masks and which have naturally distorted figures. Some figures have a truly monstrous, bestial appearance, like this dog-headed man. And not everyone is enjoying themselves. Two boys caught up with the dancers look alarmed. 
and the two figures in the foreground here seem overcome with sadness or perhaps with drink. The huge grinning face on the banner at the center is for me at least more sinister than cheerful. The composition of the painting contributes to the unsettled feeling we experience in looking at it. The, the horizon slopes markedly from left to right, giving a sense of the crowd surging along uncontrollably and making the viewer feel that they are not a detached observer, but are being swept along as part of the ritual. Scenes of contemporary religious ritual are not unknown in Western art, but they're quite unusual before the 19th century. Apart from Bruegel the Elder, this is his very famous painting of the Battle of Carnival and Lent, but apart from Bruegel, I can think of few major paintings in this category before Goya's own time. The Burial of the Sardine, however, is one of a considerable number of such scenes by Goya that take contemporary religious events and festivals as their subject. And later on, I'll make some suggestions about why this subject and similar ones might have attracted him. Goya's taking of Christ is, of course, a much more conventional subject, although I'm going to suggest that Goya's treatment of it is original in several respects. This painting was commissioned by the chapter of Toledo Cathedral in central Spain to hang in their sacristy. It shows the moment of Jesus' arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane, after the Last Supper. This event is, of course, the subject of some of the most celebrated works in the history of Western art. One by Giotto, one probably by Caravaggio. There's a bit of doubt about that. Um, already in the sacristy of the Cathedral of Toledo was a painting of a related subject, the disrobing of Christ before his crucifixion by the greatest painter in Spain in the 16th century, El Greco. It seems clear that Goya's work was a direct response to this earlier painting. There are clear similarities in the composition. Both paintings have a tall, upright format of almost identical size and proportions. In both, the central figure of Christ is advancing towards the viewer, flanked by a soldier on one side and a figure with their arm outstretched on the other. In the background of both works, a closely packed crowd looks on. Within this near identical composition, however, are many differences. El Greco's Christ is an idealized figure with his eyes turned towards heaven and his arms arranged in an elegant gesture. Christ is about to undergo suffering and humiliation, but El Greco elevates him, reminding the viewer of his divinity. He seems almost to be levitating above the sloping ground as if already born heavenward. A clearly drawn outline separates him from the other figures, and the figure taking off his robe touches only the fabric, which seems almost to have a life of its own, rather than Christ's actual body. Goya's Christ is very different. He is rooted to the ground and jostled by the crowd around him. Unlike the refined and elegant figures in the background of El Greco's painting, these are rough-looking men who shout and stare. One man roughly grabs Christ by the shoulder and pulls his body. Christ looks down towards the ground. His, he is earthbound and vulnerable. Goya's concern seem, here seems to be with painting a realistic depiction of this human drama, in, in contrast to El Greco's symbolic devotional image. This difference is underlined by the colour of Christ's robe. In El Greco's painting, this is bright red to symbolize the passion. In Goya's painting, Christ's beautifully painted robe is white, but flushed with red hues from the reflected light of torches or lanterns. He makes use of the symbolic connotations of the color, but naturalizes its presence in the context of the events of the picture. So, that's by way of, of introduction uh, to these, these two pictures and at least my, my preliminary uh, reading of them. Um, what I want to do now is, is to explore the, the context of these two pictures. One, a critical exploration of contemporary religious ritual, and the other, an unconventional treatment of a sacred subject. And I'm going to do that by setting them briefly 
in the context of Goya's artistic career and to make some suggestions as I go along, which I hope will provoke discussion um, of how they fit with his broader artistic aims and indeed the social and intellectual context of Europe at the turn of the 19th century. Goya was born in 1746. In, he grew up in the city of Zaragoza and was apprenticed to a local religious painter. In 1771, when he was 25, he traveled to Rome at his own expense. He was probably hoping that this trip would improve his skill and enhance his professional standing. Goya really makes a very, very unpromising start to his career as an artist in his early 20s. Um, he tries several times to get elected to the Royal Academy of Art in Madrid, which is the most prestigious art school in the country. Uh, but every time he submits his portfolio, um, they say no. Um, the answer, I think, the reason for that really is that actually Goya in some ways is not a hugely naturally talented artist, or at least he doesn't seem to be at the beginning of his career. He's not a sort of child prodigy uh, like Raphael. Um, and he really makes just about I suppose Cezanne would be another example, probably just about the slowest start uh, to his career of any uh, great artist in the, in the Western um, tradition. So anyway, he goes off to Rome when he's 25 to, to try and um, improve his, his standing. He, he, um, one of the sketchbooks that he takes with him on that journey survive. It contains lots of studies of classical sculptures, which is exactly what you'd expect a young artist in Italy to do in this period. Um, he comes back to Spain and the first thing that he does is to have a go at a grand historical subject. Um, not a brilliant picture uh, by any standards, um, but it does seem as if uh, Goya's journey to Italy does set him on the path to greater success. He wins some commissions for the church in and around his home city, including this picture, one of a cycle of pictures for a monastery. Goya at this early stage of his career is working very much within the mainstream tradition of 18th century European painting. And you can sort of place his early work as part of a broader shift from sort of the end of the Rococo through to the beginnings of the neoclassical style, but it's all pretty conventional stuff. Goya's big break professionally came in 1775 when he was 29. Um, and he became one of the king's painters attached to the royal court in Madrid. His bread and, bread and butter work is producing what are known as tapestry cartoons. These are large pictures that would then be sent to the royal tapestry factory to be copied as wall hangings for the king's palaces. Most of these pictures, these tapestry cartoons, show people enjoying themselves in the countryside. If you go to the Prado, they fill room after room um, and they're mostly rather charming, rather lighthearted. Not sure anyone would say that they were great art. They're nice pictures. Um, among them are, are several scenes of contemporary religious observance, such as this one of fashionably dressed pilgrims celebrating the feast of San Isidore of Seville. So that sort of subgenre of, of Goya's work of representing um, scenes of contemporary religious life goes back quite a long way. Um, 30 years, in this case, before the burial of the sardine. Um, the tapestry designs of the young Goya evidently pleased his royal masters. Occasionally, he's given the chance to paint the royal family. Here's the king himself, Charles III, who in a modest way is a sort of reforming king. He's trying to modernize Spain, which he feels, lots of other people feel, is very backward um, at this point in the late 18th century. Um, there's a lot of criticism of the excessive wealth of the Catholic Church in Spain in this period, the idleness of the nobility, um, its failure to exploit its overseas empire. Um, there's a group, particularly in Madrid, of educated um, intellectuals, middle class intellectuals, who become known as the Ilustrados, who many of them become ministers in Charles's government. Um, Goya paints quite a lot of these Ilustrados, these reformers. Um, they had to be pretty careful. Um, they admired the writings of French Enlightenment philosophers, people like Voltaire and Montesquieu and Diderot, but their works were actually banned uh, in Spain in this period, so they had to be a bit careful. They had to be careful about criticising the church because they could be prosecuted by the Inquisition. Um, so there's this sort of slightly sort of secretive uh, 
sort of reforming enlightenment um, subculture in, in Spain in this period that, that Goya really is part of, and, and he certainly paints, he corresponds with and he paints um, some of these intellectuals, like Jovellanos, um, for example. Um, 1492 is a really, uh, 1492, 1792 is a really important year in, in Goya's um, life. He's 46, uh, he's become a prosperous and successful painter, he writes a lovely letter to a childhood friend back in Zaragoza in which he talks about how good that he's really good friends with the king and that he's bought a really beautiful new carriage and that he's doing really well. At that moment, though, in 1792, Goya's world suddenly changes and he fell seriously ill, very seriously ill for about six months. And it seems that he nearly died. Um, if he had died at that point, there's no way on the basis of the work that he produced up to that point in his mid forties, that he'd be considered a significant figure in the history of art. But he did recover, um, he recovered from his illness, um, but the illness left him permanently and completely deaf. Almost immediately after this point in 1792, Goya also became a much deeper and more interesting painter. And he began to produce pictures that were unlike anything he'd done before, unlike anything that any other artist in Europe was producing it. And so either the illness or the deafness that followed it seems to have made Goya look harder at the world around him and also to have freed his imagination and led him to confront uncompromisingly the darker side of human existence. Very soon after his illness, he began to paint um, small pictures of ordinary human misfortune. So here is a, a coach being attacked. Here is a woman being uh, raped by bandits. Uh, here is a very famous picture of a madhouse. Um, none of these things, actually, none of these subjects are actually particularly unusual in the context of late 18th century painting. But what is unusual is the way in which Goya treats them. Not as entertainment, uh, not in an overtly moralizing way, but with a sort of detached realism and a pervasive sense of disillusionment about the brutal nature of the world. He also produces, these are very strange, um, uh, uh, soon after his illness, a, a series of, of pictures of, of, of witches. Um, one of the things to think about when you're looking at these pictures, or important things to remember, is that many ordinary people in late 18th century Spain still believed in witchcraft, and so did some churchmen. Um, Goya's enlightened illustrado friends in Madrid, meanwhile, regarded belief in witches as an example of the kind of irrational superstition that Enlightenment reason had demolished. These pictures, as it happens, were commissioned by the Duke of Asuna and his wife, who were important patrons of Goya and who had a big library, secret library of Enlightenment writings. Um, one art historian has suggested that these pictures appeal to Goya and his patrons as emblems of superstitions that they had transcended. I think there's a bit more to it than that. Um, they're, they're very powerful uh, paintings, um, particularly actually this one, another one in the, the series. Um, I'm pretty sure Goya didn't believe in witches, but I think he took seriously and understood the fear that belief in them could provoke. These are very unconventional witches in this picture. They're muscular and real. They're not fantastical. There's something very shocking about the way in which Goya plays on the conventions of religious paintings of the assumption of saints into heaven. There's also a real force in this picture in the terrified reaction of the figures on the ground who, who are desperately trying not to see what's happening to their companion. Um, Goya is very good at, at fear. Uh, it's a difficult thing to, to portray convincingly in art. I think Goya is the, is the preeminent painter of, of, of fear in, 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 in the history of art. Goya's big project in the 1790s is a series of prints called the Caprichos. Um, the most famous of the series is, is this image, um, but most of the, 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 the prints are more obviously satirical. The idle nobility are regular targets of these prints, but there are also numerous satires aimed at monks and priests. The concerns are, are fairly typical of, of enlightened anti-clericalism, the hypocrisy of religious orders, preaching poverty but indulging in luxury, 
the punishment of simple people for heresy, the poor intellectual standards of the clergy, the exploitation of the faithful, and so on. These are all things that, that he, he picks up on. These are printed not very long after the, the French Revolution and the attack of, on the church in France in the 1790s. It's probably not a coincidence that Goya gets permission to print uh, these um, etchings in the attic of the French embassy in Madrid. So we can see the, the beginnings here, I, I think, in these prints of, of part of the context for the burial of the sardines critical attitude um, towards religious observance and religious belief in Spain, perhaps. I think there'll be a, a sort of clearer context later. Um, Goya, um, as well as what is essentially sort of private work, uh, the, the caprichos and um, the witchcraft pictures and so on, in which Goya is sort of working out his own personal preoccupations. He also had, carries on, even after his illness and his deafness, with a very successful um, public career in which he's commissioned to paint the royal family um, and all sorts of other uh, um, illustrious um, patrons. There's though a second big upheaval in, in Goya's life um, in 1808, when Napoleon's army occupied Spain, um, throwing out his employer, Charles IV and the rest of the royal family, replacing them with, other, with, jo with Napoleon's brother, Joseph, who ruled Spain until forced to flee by uh, the army of the Duke of Wellington in 1814. Uh, the Spanish people, of course, fought bitterly against the French occupation. It's from this conflict that we have the term guerrilla war, uh, because guerrilla means little war in Spanish. Um, there are bandits living in the woods, uh, attacking the French troops, They're impossible to suppress, um, and, and do contribute, I think, quite considerably to the final collapse of the Napoleonic Empire. This struggle of the Spanish against the, the, the French conquerors um, inspires some of Goya's great, greatest works. This is the most famous. Um, this shows the execution of men, man, suspected of being one of the rioters um, during an uprising to protest against the forced removal of the royal family from Madrid in 1808. Goya also produces a series of prints about the, the war, um, known as the disasters of war. His emphasis isn't on the military conflict, but on the devastation and suffering that it caused. So here is a man encountering um, a pile of bodies. Um, this is one of the most shocking of all of them, a, a, a man's body mutilated and degraded by the enemy. Um, the figure of this man, um, who might be either French or Spanish, I don't think you can tell, um, has, I think, an unexpected uh, source. Um, and I think uh, it's based on the Belvedere torso, which Goya came across in um, Italy decades before and drew. Um, and, I, and I wonder whether Goya is, what Goya is doing here is using this ancient fragment as the basis for this mutilated body. Um, as a way of saying there's sort of a difference between the idealized body of classical art and the real human body, which suffers and is, and is vulnerable. And that therefore his new, more realistic kind of art is the thing that's really appropriate for depicting the horrors of the world around him. Um, as we might expect, the church in Spain suffered very badly at the hands of the, the French and several of the prints in, in Goya's series show his sympathy for the fate of the church. So here is a priest being executed. Um, here is a, a church being looted um, while the priest or the monk um, is, um, is, is, is being tied up or, or, or beaten up. So these are, these are essentially sympathetic, but there are also um, rather more prints in this series that are critical um, of the Spanish church. This is the, the clearest of those. In, in an earlier, in a study for this, in a drawing for this print, um, the figure on the tightrope is clearly identifiable as, identifiable as the Pope. Uh, he changes it in the, in the actual printed engraving to a priest. Um, but the, the sentiment underlying it, the anti-clerical sent, sentiment underlying it is nonetheless um, fairly clear, or at least it's made clear by the caption that Goya gives. Um, there's also this very strange uh, picture of um, some old men uh, carrying a figure of, a, of the Virgin Mary of the kind that were often 
uh, processed through the streets in, and still are in, in many parts of the Catholic world um, on festival days, um, which in many cases were, were prayed to and were felt to have miracle working properties. But in the way that Goya uh, represents it in this print, um, he's, if you like, literally showing its hollowness. Uh, and and he's he's sort of desacralizing this sacred object in in a really I mean it's still slightly surprising to us and I think it must have been really quite shocking to people who saw it um, in the 1810s. So what one starts to build up through his career this sort of um, critical attitude that Goya has towards the church and towards um, aspects of traditional religious observance. Um, as the Peninsula War goes on, lots of the Spaniards view themselves as not just fighting against the French, but also for rights and freedoms that they had never been granted by their own rulers. In 1811, an unofficial government is set up in Cadiz. It draws up its own constitution, which ironically uh, includes many of the central provisions of the French revolutionary rights of man and of the citizen. Um, and after the war, um, many people hope that Spain will become a more democratic country in which the sufferings of the poor are reduced um, and the influence of the church is, is, is um, reduced. Uh, what actually happens is a great disappointment to them because in Spain, as elsewhere in Europe after Napoleon, um, there is a return to the status quo. And the restored heir to the throne is this man, Ferdinand VII, who was uh, by all accounts stupid and cruel um, and also exceptionally conservative. He actually doesn't reintroduce the old regime just as it has existed before um, Napoleon's invasion, but actually reverses some of the liberalizing reforms of his predecessors. Uh, so the Inquisition, for example, under Ferdinand VII is restored to a position of power that it hadn't had since the early 18th century, about 100 years um, earlier. Um, after half a century in which the Inquisition in Spain had never used the death penalty, they begin in the 1820s to start to put people um, on trial and to execute them for heresy again. Um, materially, Goya does quite well out of this um, restoration. He, he returns to his position as a court painter. He produces a number of pictures of the king. Privately, however, he's dismayed um, at this turn of events of this conservative government being reimposed. Um, and he, it's clear that he shares the despair of people who uh, had hoped for a more liberal progressive regime. At this point, um, Goya produces a number of pictures that um, take the Spanish church and contemporary religious observance as their subject. Um, this is one of them um, showing some people put on trial by the Inquisition. Um, it's pretty clear that our sympathies here are directed to those who were put on trial. Um, there is also a scene of um, a procession of flagellants, uh, people whipping themselves as part of a, a, a probably a Holy Week uh, festival. Uh, represented in really quite an un unsettling way. It, it, it would be very hard to look at this and to feel that uh, Goya approved of this activity. Notice also that we've got this figure of the Virgin now being carried upright, uh, but in a, in a print that Goya has made, is making it about the same time. Of course, this is the one where we see her on her side. Um, it's probably into this series of pictures the, the burial of the sardine fits. Um, I should say that there's actually some doubt about the, the dating of this picture. We don't know who commissioned it. Uh, if anyone did commission it, Goya may have just painted it um, himself. Um, and it doesn't have a very secure early provenance. Um, by the second half of the 19th century, we know that this picture, along with these two, are all in the same place um, in the Royal Academy of Arts, in or the Museum of the Royal Academy of Arts in, in Madrid. Uh, and so they probably do kind of constitute um, some sort of um, uh, uh, series. Um, one of the things that one notices looking at, at this picture is, is Goya's, I think, evident concern for sort of the manic nature of crowds or the danger that is present in, in crowds. 
um, particularly when allied to matters of religion. There's a, there's a fairly clear context for that concern in some of Goya's um, other works. Sorry, don't know what that's doing there. Um, in um, a group of paintings that he paints on the walls of his house uh, in the 1820s. So when he's a very old man um, in his 70s, um, Goya is living at a, in a house um, outside Madrid called the Quinta del Sordo, the house of the, the deaf man. Um, really weirdly, it was already called that before Goya bought it. Perhaps that's why he bought it. Anyway, uh, he buys this house and he's living there and he decides to decorate um, the walls of the house with his own paintings, uh, painted directly onto the, the plaster. Um, what he paints, I'm afraid, isn't very nice. Uh, a series of, of really frightening, unsettling paintings um, known as the black paintings. This is the most uh, famous of them. So this is this is Saturn. Um, uh, fearing that he will be over this Saturn from, from Greek and Roman legend, fearing that he will be overthrown by his uh, one of his own children and eats them all in, in turn. Um, I had a boy in my class once who uh, never really um, said very much in, in class and, and didn't contribute a great deal, but he once he had made an absolutely brilliant observation about this painting. He said it was as if Saturn had just caught sight of what he was doing in a mirror. Uh, which I think is, is, is a brilliant observation and has always stuck with me and has, has become part of the way that I, that I see that, that picture. Um, there's a sort of witch's Sabbath um, as one of these. Um, there are also a couple of paintings that show the, the dark side of religious ritual. So here we have a procession of pilgrims um, who um, sort of seem to be almost kind of driven mad um, they're, they're singing, but their mouths are open in these sort of horrific howls, and they're winding their way menacingly like a sort of snake, human snake, through the, the landscape. So I think this is, I'm sort of build, trying to build up a picture of, of where the burial of the sardine fits in here, and, and some of the ways in which we might read it in the light of Goya's other paintings. Um, and I think that there's this, this recurrent theme in, in Goya's work. Um, whether you call it anti-clericalism, or something a bit more general about the, the, the darker side of religious observance um, and, and the negative aspects of, of ritual. Oh, there we are, there's a close up of the, of the, of the, the pilgrims of um, San Isidore. Um, and there, there's the crowd in, in the burial of the, the sardine. Um, I mentioned that, um, touched on the fact that Goya sort of has two sides to his um, artistic practice. There's the work that he's producing, um, which is very personal, um, which is about him um, either for himself or for sympathetic patrons. It's about working out his own preoccupations as an artist. Sometimes one feels exercising his own demons. Um, that's a very modern idea um, in, in art. Goy is very unusual to be doing that as early as the as the beginning of the 19th century. But he also has this public side to his 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 um, career. Um, and he carries on right up to the end of his life in the 1820s, having a very successful public career, executing commissions for the church and for the crown and for wealthy patrons. One of the striking things, though, about Goya's public commissions is that they show as you go through his career, and particularly after a, around 1800, a increasing tendency towards realism um, and a departure from the usual artistic conventions. So this painting of Charles IV and his family, um, sometimes people get the idea that this is a satire on the royal family uh, because um, they look sort of slightly kind of vacant and gormless. Uh, and uh, th there's a very famous line by uh, an early um, art historian who wrote in the 19th century about Goya, um, who said that he'd made Charles IV and his family um, look like a grocer who'd won the lottery, um, i.e. that they were these sort of fairly kind of rough and ready people dressed up uh, as, the, as, the, as the royal family. Now, none of that really is, is right. I mean, I don't think there's any sense in which, in which uh, Goya is making fun of them. Um, but what he is doing, I think, is, is, is painting them as they really appear without the level, without the degree of, of flattery and artifice that had come to be expected in royal portraiture. 
Um, you, you can see that also, I think, if you compare his portrait of, of um, Ferdinand VII with some portraits of Ferdinand VII by other artists. So that's Goya's on the left and then two other artists, I'm afraid I don't remember who, um, the other two. And you can see that, that um, the Goya is exhibiting a much kind of greater, um, it's still flattering in some ways, but it's more, it's much closer to real appearance. And he looks much like a more like a real man uh, than in, in the other two. Um, that's also true, of course, about the, the 3rd of May, um, which as a, as a realistic depiction of a contemporary historical event is almost, is I think without precedent um, in the history of art. So this is a history painting that doesn't glorify, just like paintings of the royal family that don't, um, that don't flatter. Um, Goya's realism in, entails the development of a new style. Um, without the artificial devices of the Rococo neoclassical traditions in which he'd been trained. Um, it's a style of painting that becomes very influential on later 19th century artists, particularly on Manet. Manet is really obsessed with Goya, um, and, and a lot of what Manet is doing in the 1850s and 1860s, I think is explicable partly in terms of the, the influence of, of Goya. That realistic approach in his, in his publicly commissioned um, uh, work and his willingness to go against convention is, I think, particularly true in Goya's religious um, uh, paintings and his, his religious um, commissions. Um, Goya's religious paintings, really from the 1790s onwards, become highly unconventional um, in, their, in their realism. Um, a good example of that is Goya's fresco for a, the dome of a church in Madrid, which shows one of the miracles of St. Anthony of Padua. Um, one thing to note about this is that it's an inversion of the usual structure of an 18th century ceiling painting, because normally what we would expect um, is to have the heavenly realm in the ceiling with the earth um, below it, as in this example by Cipollo, but one could pick hundreds of, of others. Um, but what Goya does is to put the earthly scene around the dome, and then actually, although you can't see them here, the angels on clouds below it. Um, the, the scene uh, that Goya is representing here is of St. Anthony bringing, a miracle of St. Anthony bringing a man back to life. Um, and this, um, this reviving of the dead man is painted in, when you see it close up, an extraordinarily um, realistic way. Um, you also have figures who rather rough looking uh, people um, who seem to be based on sort of real social types that Goya might have seen on the streets of Madrid. Um, that realism um, extends to the very untypical angels that Goya paints, um, who really don't look very heavenly. Um, they're, they're extraordinary sort of, um, sort of robust and, uh, and fleshy. Um, the art critic Robert Hughes uh, once said that, that um, that he thought that they were the most attractive angels uh, in the history of art. And I, and I think, you know, he meant because they actually seem like human beings um, much more than, than, than angels. Um, if you, this is a strong contrast to Goya's earlier um, religious paintings. So these are religious paintings by Goya from the 1780s, um, where he's much more within a first of Rococo and then really a sort of neoclassical um, tradition. Perhaps in the last one, as a sort of turn to uh, greater realism, but these are these are this is Goya working in a in a conventional um, mode of, of um, religious um, painting, um, and I think it's 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 in this that we can see uh, a context for for the taking of of Christ. Um, it's part of a larger project that Goya has in his public commissions um, to reimagine portraiture, history painting, and religious painting in more realistic uh, terms. It's something that, this is a picture from the 1790s, it's something that goes on to the end of his um, career. Um, so in this rather touching uh, picture, uh, one of the last religious commissions that he paints, um, or indeed this one. Um, you know, there's a radically kind of, radical kind of realism about, um, about, these, about these works. Um, Robert Hughes, this is the last thing I'll say, but um, Robert Hughes, um, who has really interesting things to say about Goya, one of the things he says about Goya is that Goya is fiercely anti-clerical uh, and deeply religious. 
Um, and I and I and I think if if we if we look at uh, the two paintings that I've sort of highlighted as either end of Lent, um, there's element of both of those things there. So so um, I think there is an element of anti-clericalism, or at least sort of suspicion about what um, contemporary religious ritual might involve. Um, but also um, we have in the um, in the taking of Christ um, a sense of his um, deep religious faith, uh, because I think only someone of deep religious faith really would be invested in reimagining uh, the sacred scene in the way that he does. Good, I'll, uh, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Richard. That was an incredibly rich feast for us to think about. Does anyone have any questions or observations? We can't see all of you, so it might be best if you put up a... Oh, do, do a, you want, go, I suppose we could go back, actually, couldn't we? Is, that's, it, is it better if I keep sharing all day? Because I mean, I'm just thinking about, do we need to see the pictures in we order We might to, need to see uh, the pictures. Uh, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't think of that. <laughs> <laughs> but if you'd like to raise a virtual hand or indeed just shout, hmm. um, that's fine. Well, I was just thinking, Richard, listening to that, that... I was fascinated by the contrast between the, the anti-clericalism and, and the, the religious feeling. And I was just wondering, is there any room in Goya for redemption? Because the, the depth of the religious feeling seems to be really, in a way, kind of encapsulated in those downward eyes of Christ there. I, I'm wondering, you know, is there, is there any room for hope anywhere? Um. That's a, that's a great question. I, so there's definitely a reading of Goya um, that he's a sort of hopeless artist. There's a there's a there's a print in the Disasters of War series, which shows um, uh, uh, the body of a of a, a dead man. I mean, a sort of partially kind of rotted cadaver uh, who uh, has written on a piece of paper uh, nada nothing uh and and this is this has been interpreted as, as as goya saying you know there's no hope of of life after death uh there's no place for sort of um redemption and and so on and and i think it's easy when you look at goya um to be a bit kind of ground down yes. <laughs> by him right you know which is just you know it's just one awful thing really uh after another um, in Goya's paintings, but there are there are there are hopeful things. That the last drawing that Goya ever did um, is a is a self portrait of him as an old man with a sort of comically enormous um, beard um, and propped up on two sticks, uh, and underneath he's written, uh, "I'm still learning," uh, <laughs> which is a sort of lovely kind of hopeful uh, statement. There's also another drawing he does in the last maybe year of his life. Um, of an old man, but it's really a self-portrait because it looks like Goya, of an old man on a swing, uh, sort of cackling uh, away. Um, so there is sort of joy there, and there are elements of, of hopefulness. Yeah. Um, I mean, I sort of wanted to, to kind of highlight Goya's, I mean, I'm sort of obsessed with Goya, you can probably, probably pick that up, but, and, I, and I wanted to sort of highlight Goya's religious paintings because in lots of ways, they're quite an overlooked part of his work. And the conventional way of thinking about Goya's religious paintings is effectively to say, well, he had to earn a living somehow. Um, and, um, and, uh, but I suppose I want to suggest there's a bit more to it than that, actually, um, that he's really quite invested um, uh, in these pictures. I, I mean, I find um, the taking of Christ, um, I've only seen it once in the flesh, but I find the taking of Christ a, a very touching uh, picture. Um, and I think, I think it's that expression of Christ that, um, see if I can, um, zoom in a bit, um, which is which is really the sort of touching thing. Mm. He comes across as quite a disturbed man in his painting. I mean, you know, all the grotesque faces and and and, and the artwork on the walls of his home. I mean, fancy having that Saturn <laughs> figure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, but then, 
those the the quite late on religious paintings seemed yeah. much more much calmer pictures. They do. Yeah, they do. Yeah. As if you'd sort of uh, maybe come to terms with some things. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I I wonder about that. I really do. Yeah, I I think that I'm quite convinced by that idea. Um, <laughs> he he asked to be buried. This is a, a, a sort of fact I left out of the talk, but he at least we have it on pretty good authority that he asked to be buried in a Franciscan habit, um, <laughs> which kind of suggests that he was either formally or informally or sort of thought of himself as a kind of lay brother um, of the Franciscans at the end of his life. Um, now, that's an odd request in some ways, isn't it, for someone who um, 30 years earlier had done those really sort of caustic satires of monks, um, you know, for force feeding people or or getting drunk or, you know, reviling them for their stupidity and so on. So I think there probably is a turn. Um, we don't know much about Goya's, apart from the evidence of the word, we don't know that much about Goya's interior life. Um, there's about a hundred letters by Goya that survive, but they're, they're nearly all from the early part of his um, life and the later ones are not very informative. Um, I mean, it's interesting that you pick up on the on the the the, the sort of grotesque faces. Um, I think Goya's faces are a really interesting, uh, a really interesting topic because you do recurrently have these sort of, I mean, like in this picture, these sort of horrible sort of yeah. wide open mouths and these sort of howling, shouting um, figures. David Sylvester, a great art critic of the mid twentieth century, um, said. Um, that mouths are, are terribly important to Goya's expressive project, that most artists convey um, feeling and emotion through, um, through the eyes and through gesture. Uh, but Goya amazingly can, can invest pictures with a huge amount of, of feeling um, through the way that he depicts mouths. Um, <laughs> Is it a bit ridiculous to say yeah. that's partly because he's deaf? I mean, yeah, I, yeah. So that's exactly what I was about to yeah, say. Yeah. That, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That he would have been much more aware of people's mouths as a deaf person. Yeah, yeah. Because I think what you get in Goya, right? Mm -hmm. it, you get, you get the, you get the sight of the sound, don't you? Mm -hmm. Yes. It's it's a funny paradox that that a deaf person should paint pictures that are in some sense so full of sound, mm -hmm. and that when you look at them, you can sort of hear it, can't you? There, there was one painting of witches in which there was somebody lying on the ground with uh, his hands over his ears. Yeah. Which I, which I thought was interesting for a deaf person. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Can, can I ask you a question then um, about his personal life? You say what we know very, very little about him. Was, was he married? Did he have children? You know? Yeah. See, he had a. Works? Did he move in? Um, he, he had a wife, um, Josepha, um, who was um, the sister of a painter that he often worked with when he was young. Um, we don't know anything about her. No letters between them survive. Um, possibly she couldn't read or, or write. Um, he, now this is a bit, this is rather, rather uh, sad but there are no certain portraits uh, by Goya of his wife, um, even drawings. Um, so it's not, we don't even know what she looked like. Um, there's a few that have been suggested. Um, they had one son who survived to adulthood and six or seven children who died in, um, in infancy. Um, yes, really. yeah. But that's that, I mean, for family life, that's sort of it. Sorry, I missed, Jean, I missed the, just the last part of your question. Um, oh, what sort of networks did he move in? Did he move with fellow artists, you know, in that sort of circle or? Yeah, so he's from quite humble. Friends, really. He's from yeah. quite a humble background. Um, uh, I, I suppose you'd, I mean, he has an aristocratic name, um, but, and, and his family has an aristocratic title, but of course that doesn't actually mean all that much in 18th century Spain, because something like one in 20 of, uh, um, adult men uh, could claim to be members of the nobility, so it doesn't really, it doesn't really mean very much. Um, and he seems to have had a sort of what, I suppose what you might call a kind of lower middle class um, uh, background. 
Um, but he went up in the world a bit when he got to Madrid. Um, and he does mix with government ministers uh, and with some members of the, of, of the aristocracy um, and, and so on. So he, he becomes part of sort of fashionable metropolitan culture. Um, after his deafness, he becomes rather more reclusive um, and doesn't seem to have had huge sort of social existence. May I, may I ask a question about the taking of Christ's picture? Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's, um, for reasons I won't go into now, I'm very intrigued by representations of Judas in art. So this may be meaning that I'm reading something into this painting that isn't really there, but I, I'm intrigued by the figure in the foreground who looks as though he's sort of poking Jesus in the, in the stomach. Yeah, there's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Is is is, is do you, who is that figure? Do you think, or is it hard? Well, isn't it? Because because I wonder if if this is is Judas. Well, I was wondering that too. You know, because because he, I, was thinking, I was thinking about the pointing. Yeah, you know, because he's you do often see him sort of on the shoulder. I suppose because you he's do, giving yeah. him a kiss. Give him a kiss. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it but it you know but is it the figure actually in the foreground who's sort of pointing something out or giving directions to the soldier or, or I I I can't decide. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, that's not a very helpful answer. No, no, no. Well, uh, but it, I, I but there is a kind of ambiguity, isn't there, about how we? Yeah, there is ambiguity. And if you look in the background too, you know, what one could say: well, are some of these figures the disciples, or are they all yeah. sort of attendants of the of the troops who've come to arrest them? And, and it's pretty hard, isn't it, to decide that? Hard to say. Yeah. Mm. No, that ambiguity is what partly what makes the painting so arresting, I guess. Mm. You're not quite sure what's going on and who's no, who. No, yeah. no. He's a much more realistic looking Jesus than you often see as well. as I mean, his, his colouring mm. is much more naturalistic, isn't it, than we're yeah. used to. Really? In the El Greco, he's sort of extraordinarily pale, really. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pale you know, that's, that's yeah. partly just to sort of distinguish him pictorially from the the other the other figures around. Yeah. I mean, I'm very glad to see these religious paintings because I've only really looked at the more sort of creepy ones and uh, <laughs> the sort of darker side of him. So. It, it's mm. been fascinating seeing these. It, it's very good. Yeah. Um, can I just ask if um, the paintings that um, are the dark and creepy ones, yeah. um, are, were they commissioned or not? How much um, influence would the commissioner have on Goya's work? So, um, so most of the... the um, Sort of more disturbing uh, paintings by Goya um, are not commissioned. Commissioned, no. So they are um, his real them, sort of thoughts. He, yeah, he painted them for himself. Um, yeah, which, which which is a really pretty sort of extraordinary thing to do um, uh, in the late eighteenth and the early nineteenth centuries. I mean, we now think of of art as being a sort of means for personal expression or a way of working through personal preoccupations as being a kind of central part of what art is about. But that's a very alien idea of the function of art um, in 1800. And, and Goya mm. is, is a real pioneer in terms of the, I mean, there are early examples, you know, Rembrandt makes art for himself to some extent, uh, uh, you know, rather than for sale or, or, or on commission. But no one, I, no one before Goya goes anything like as far down that, that line. Um, so most of the, you know, the black paintings he paints on the wall of his house, um, uh, the prints, the disasters of war um, prints, um, um, etchings, when we get to those, uh, uh, these, these are not published during um, Goya's lifetime. Um, okay. They're designed and the plates are etched, but they are not printed until the 1860s, because in the end, Goya thought that they might get him into trouble. Okay. Uh, so, so, so there's this huge amount of personal work. Now, one or two of the more sort of um, unnerving pictures are commissioned work. Um, so the, um, the Asuna witchcraft pictures, 
are actually a commission, um, but they're a commission for a very sort of um, enlightened patron who basically just says to Goya, use your imagination, paint what you like, we'll buy it. Uh, so, I mean, in that sense, they're, they're, they're almost equally uh, personal. Thank you. It's got a kind of theatrical light about it, hasn't it? Yeah. Does anyone else have a question? No. Well, thank you so much, Richard. I know I want to go back and look at all of those again. <laughs> <laughs> it's been absolutely fascinating and wonderful to have you with us. Thank, thank you very you. much indeed. Yeah, um, thank you. <laughs> we're also yeah. really privileged to have um, both uh, last week's speaker, Harriet, and next week's speaker, <laughs> the Dean, on the call with us. So just um, a reminder to everyone that last week's talk is available um, to watch again, as this one will be. And next week, we look forward very much to welcoming the Dean to speak. So do join us at the same time, half past seven next Wednesday. Thank you all so much. And thank you again, Richard. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very thank much, you. Richard. That was, that was really outstanding. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah fascinating.